In a significant geopolitical shift, several key Arab nations have distanced themselves from Israel amid escalating tensions with Iran following the assassination of Ismail Haniyeh, a prominent Palestinian political leader. This development marks a dramatic change in the regional dynamics, with Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Jordan and Egypt taking unprecedented stances that could reshape the balance of power in the Middle East. The assassination of Ismail Haniyeh has sent shockwaves throughout the Middle East, igniting a wave of condemnation and setting the stage for potential conflict. Haniyeh, a leading figure in Palestinian politics, was seen by many as a symbol of resistance against Israeli policies. His death has been perceived by Iran and its allies as a blatant provocation, crossing a significant red line. Traditionally, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Jordan and Egypt have maintained complex relationships with Israel, often balancing their strategic interests with regional and international pressures. However, the recent assassination has prompted these nations to re-evaluate their positions. They have collectively condemned the act and pledged to remain neutral, a stance that has been met with both support and criticism. Qatar, known for its independent foreign policy, has often played a mediating role in regional conflicts. Its decision to distance itself from Israel in this context reflects its commitment to regional stability and its long-standing support for Palestinian rights. As a leading power in the Arab world, Saudi Arabia's neutrality is particularly significant, suggesting a shift towards prioritizing regional harmony over its strategic alliance with Israel. Sharing a border with both Israel and the Palestinian territories, Jordan's stance is crucial. Historically a key partner of Israel, Jordan's neutrality indicates a growing frustration with Israeli actions that threaten regional stability. Egypt's position as a regional power and its role in mediating Israeli-Palestinian conflicts add weight to its decision to condemn the assassination and adopt a neutral stance. Despite these nations' efforts to adopt a neutral position, they have faced severe criticism. Accusations have surfaced, suggesting that their neutrality is a strategic move to protect Israel while frustrating Iranian responses. Critics argue that these countries have historically acted as puppets of the West, prioritizing Western interests over regional solidarity. The deployment of anti-missile systems by Jordan, Saudi Arabia and Egypt in the past to intercept Iranian missiles highlights the complex nature of their relationships with Israel. In April, these nations' actions effectively defended Israeli interests by preventing Iranian retaliation for the assassination of a top IRGC leader in Syria. This history raises questions about the true extent of their current neutrality. The current stance of these Arab nations could have significant implications for regional security. Should Iran decide to retaliate for Haniyeh's assassination? The likelihood of its missiles traversing the airspaces of these countries and striking critical targets in Israel increases. The ambiguity surrounding their willingness to intercept such missiles adds an element of uncertainty to the already volatile situation. Israel now finds itself in a precarious position, facing potential isolation in the region. The distancing of its Arab allies undermines its strategic depth and complicates its defense strategies. Israel must now navigate a more challenging geopolitical landscape, balancing its security needs with the necessity of rebuilding relationships with its regional neighbors. On the part of the Islamic Republic of Iran, the re-establishment of its strategic deterrence against Israeli aggression is crucial in maintaining its grip on mutually assured consequences for any action against it. Iran's interest is to demonstrate to Israel that there are severe consequences when red lines are crossed and international sovereign laws are trampled upon. The assassination of Ismail Haniyeh, a trusted member of the Palestinian political movement, has sent a confused message to the resistance, indicating that even Iranian territory is not safe for them. This situation has complicated Iran's defense and military intelligence posture among its allies underscoring the need for a robust response. Iran's diplomatic maneuvers have been equally significant. Tehran sought the support of Muslim countries in the escalating conflict with Israel by calling for an emergency meeting of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, OIC, in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. This move came in response to Haniyeh's assassination on July 31st in Tehran, a strike attributed to Israel.
The meeting's objective was to galvanize collective condemnation and support from the Muslim world. Saudi Arabia, the leader of the Sunni Muslim world, gave Iran its approval and broke its silence on the matter. The Saudi condemnation was a significant diplomatic win for Iran, as Riyadh joined other OIC member countries in denouncing the assassination. Ismail Haniyeh's assassination is a flagrant violation of Iran's sovereignty, territorial integrity and national security, as well as international law and the United Nations Charter, which threatens to destabilize the region, declared Saudi diplomacy. This statement reflected a unified stance within the OIC, highlighting the gravity of the situation and the potential for broader regional implications. The assassination has put Iran in a position where it must restore its deterrence to maintain credibility and support among its allies. The attack in the heart of Tehran was a direct affront to Iran's national security, and the need for a firm response has been a focal point of Iranian rhetoric. Tehran's promise of a firm response aims to reassure its allies and deter future aggressions by demonstrating that such violations will not go unanswered. This strategic posture is not only about immediate retaliation, but also about long-term regional influence and power dynamics. Iran's ability to project strength and respond effectively to such provocations is critical in maintaining its leadership role among its allies and within the broader Muslim world. The support from OIC member countries, particularly from influential players like Saudi Arabia, adds weight to Iran's position and signals a potential shift in regional alliances and strategies. The broader implications of these developments are profound. The assassination and subsequent diplomatic responses have the potential to reshape regional power dynamics, influencing not only Iran-Israel relations, but also the relationships among other key players in the Middle East. As tensions continue to simmer, the actions taken by Iran and its allies will be closely watched by the international community with the potential for significant impacts on regional stability and global geopolitical trends. Michael Brenner is a professor of international affairs at the University of Pittsburgh and a senior fellow at the Center for Transatlantic Relations at SAES Johns Hopkins in Washington, D.C. He is an active contributor to research and consulting projects focusing on Euro-American security and economic issues. His academic expertise encompasses American foreign policy, Euro-American relations, and the European Union. Brenner is a prolific author, having written numerous books and over 60 articles and papers on a wide array of topics. His analysis of the current situation and the emerging unity between Shia and Sunni Muslims in response to Israeli belligerence is considered one of the most insightful and comprehensive evaluations to date. I think as, as Ambassador Chas Freeman has explained in a video interview you did uh, yesterday and others, uh, this sort of represents a, a, a manifest attempt on the part of the Israeli government, and it's not just Bibi Netanyahu and the hard right, well, it's more than hard right, neo sort of fascist in his, his, his government, uh, to trigger a crisis with Iran that would bring the United States in on Israel's side and that it would be American power that will fulfill the Israeli ambition to crush and subdue all of its enemies, all of its rivals uh, in the region, including Hezbollah, Iran, and associated parties. I mean, that's clear. That's the cynical ploy, uh, because I think the, the IDF, the Israeli military, recognizes they're on their own if they were to try and tackle Iran, Hezbollah, et cetera, even if they were to tackle and attack uh, directly, fully one of them, Hezbollah, that this would result in the physical destruction of Israel. Um, and so it's, 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 it's kind of a, Sam, a well, um, Samson option, at least you risk pulling down the temple on, on yourself in order to reach an objective, an absolutist objective, which otherwise is only realistic, but 
in a, in a, but to which you are committed because of your own fanaticism. And that's what's happening. And the United States has allowed itself and Hungary has fallen into this trap by in effect saying, even in the last couple of days, that if Israel is endangered or gets into a, a serious uh, military exchange with Iran, it'll back Israel. Now, if you can, if you are genuinely concerned, or people are genuinely in Washington are genuinely concerned about a wider Middle East war, and most of them indeed are, this is the most illogical thing to do. You don't want to embolden the Israelis to provoke actions, which, because of your your prior statements and commitments and and domestic center pressures. Uh, would lead you into a a general war. So the United States, the American leaders, uh, particularly in this administration, have all lost all sense of, of tactful diplomacy, and in fact, uh, all all common sense. And that makes it most extremely in da- dangerous. And by implication, it means that the avoidance of this sort of catastrophe uh, rests upon belief that other leaders will be more cool-headed, more rational, uh, more cautious than American leaders. That includes the leaders in Tehran uh, and in uh, Hezbollah and in Moscow, broadly. And of course, the antithesis of the kind of impulsive, uh, panic-driven, irrational conduct that you see from Washington, the antithesis is Vladimir Putin, who is restrained, who's cautious, who's deliberate, who has a masterful understanding of the forces at work. And you can say the same for Xi in in China. If in Moscow and Beijing, you would have counterparts and Tehran, if you were to find counterparts to the people who rule in Washington now, we already would have been in a major war. It's difficult to come up with an adequate, adequate and plausible explanation because this places us in the domain of psychopathology and collective psychopathology. I mean, this is depraved behavior. Um, and to do, in order to, to, to explain depraved behavior, it's difficult to do it, to do so in regard to specific individuals. Uh, it's even more difficult to do it with regard to a fanatical movement like ISIS, the Islamic State. Uh, you know, which has, uh, you know, sort of escapes most conventional sort of categories and you have to, you know, hop back to fanatical movements, whether of religious nature or a secular nature like, uh, you know, like Nazism, etc., to understand it. But now in the case of Israel, you have both phenomena. You do have individual psychopaths like like Smodrich and Al Gavir, etc. You have a, a, a fanatical groups movement uh, like a, like ISIS, right? And Hebrew jihadis, right? And then you have something which has you know, few counterparts elsewhere or historically, and that is a whole country, admittedly a small country with a very peculiar history, uh, with a persecution complex, good part justified, of course, uh, devoted to an ethic of victimization and who increasingly have been brainwashed through propaganda uh, in education, the kinds of texts used apparently in uh, Israeli public schools, uh, promotes 
these kinds of, of attitudes. And of course, it's, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy in concrete terms for the Palestinians. It likely will prove a tragedy for the Israelis themselves. And of course, in a more abstract historical sense, it is a great tragedy of the people who for two millennia have been the, the subject of, of unmatched persecution in the, the Christian world, more so, by the way, than in the Islamic world, starkingly different, right? which culminated in the mass slaughter of the Holocaust, now behaving in a depraved manner of their most uh, psychopathological persecutors. I mean, that is a, a tragedy, um, you know, I'm, I'm probably does have corresponding or counterparts in, in history, but of, of historic noteworthy as an historic event, uh, have never allowed their national policies to, towards Israel to be dictated by the plight of the Palestinians. And they made their own calculating, uh, pragmatic, self-interested decisions to find a modus vivendi with Israel and, and in more recent years to do business with them. In fact, to this day, uh, Saudi Arabia and Turkey and, uh, sort of supply oil involved in arrangements that supply oil to, to Israel. Uh, but it's their populists which are absolutely enraged and those leaders, particularly in places like Jordan and Egypt, uh, are fearful that they might find themselves, uh, you know, the targets of a mass uprising, which would uh, you know, result not only in their being uh, kicked out of office, but uh, have their lives, lives threatened. So they're walking a, a tightrope. Because on the other hand, they don't want to totally alienate the United States and the Europeans who wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly support the Israelis and which are using coercive pressure, financial especially, against a vulnerable country like Egypt and, and, and Jordan as, as well, uh, to stress that, look, whatever the pressures you're under domestically, if you really go all in in support of the Palestinians, you're going to suffer because we are going to crack down on you. That was the message we took to Sisi. In fact, let's recall in October, shortly after the October 7 events, uh, Secretary Blinken went to Cairo and uh, tried very hard to persuade Sisi to accept the Palestinians being exiled and forced out of Palestine. The United States in October supported the cleansing of Palestine and their displacement into the Sinai Desert. And Sisi told Blinken, you're nuts. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to consider it. No matter what you threaten me with, no matter what promises will come from you or the rich Gulf states about uh, financing the resettlement of two million people in, in the Sinai. Uh, so that's the dilemma, or the self-imposed dilemma that the, the Arab leaders have. Uh, and um, they really don't know what to do. They equivocate. Right? And I think, uh, although it does, the changes that have been induced and, and which are noticeable uh, have to do with the, uh, this um, partial reconciliation or temporary reconciliation between the Shiites, which means not just Iran, but Hezbollah and the Houthis, or, although the Houthis are from a heterodox branch of Shiism who historically have been condemned by the Iranians. So that's uh, 
bit of an irony there. But in any case, yes, there's a recognition uh, that, that we as, as Muslims, Shia or Sunni, right, are being threatened, are being humiliated, and, and, and therefore we have to sort of set aside our own mutual antagonisms in order to try and come 